slash afternoon. Uh, I'm Dr. Eccles, and you guys are definitely warriors. Uh, you, you're here to the end. All right, well, over the next 20 minutes or so, um, I'm going to discuss game time decisions, on the field management of injuries, and return to play decisions uh, with reference triathletes. Now, obviously, that's a very broad topic. And I can sit up here and talk for over an hour uh, on this topic. But obviously, I only have uh, 20 minutes. Uh, OK, okay which button was this again? The big red somewhere. Here? No, oh, in the middle. Oh, right Great. there. OK, gotcha. All right. So the way I want to approach this uh, is that initially, we'll discuss some of the broad concepts uh, associated with uh, medical management of an athletic uh, association. Uh, and we'll also discuss some of the more broad concepts uh, regarding return to play decisions. Ultimately, after we get through that, then we'll look at some of the more specific instances in which we apply these principles. All right, so first slide I have up here is the team approach. And why did I put that up there? Well, obviously, the team physician does not operate within a vacuum. Uh, he has a medical staff. Um, and depending on uh, the size of the uh, organization you're dealing with, that will kind of determine uh, the structure of your staff. If you're dealing with, say, high school, you may just have your, your trainer, and it's you. Conversely, uh, if you're at a collegiate level, chances are you have multiple trainers, a head trainer, uh, probably a primary care uh, sports medicine doc, and then your team surgeon. Uh, obviously, at a professional level, you have more layers than that. The key thing that I'm trying to uh, get to, though, is that obviously the size of the organizations are going to determine the structure of your medical team. And that has to be defined. Everyone needs to know the hierarchy of the organization so that communication can be clear, timely, and concise. And then everyone has to be on the same string. And as long as you have that, then you can communicate with the other parties that are involved. That's important because obviously, if everybody does not appear organized, sometimes you can get coaching staffs that kind of go rogue. If they don't feel you know what you're doing or they don't feel you have the best interest, they just kind of start making decisions on their own, which is obviously not good. You tend to only see that more so at a high school level, not so much at the uh, collegiate and professional level. Uh, but that's important. And you can see here I've got the principal parties uh, that are involved here. The medical team, for obvious reasons. Then I've got the coaching staff. As I said before, if in fact you've got clear, timely, concise communication and everybody is saying the same thing, then that coaching staff has more confidence in what you're saying and therefore they're likely to agree with you and give you less pushback. Next, I have the parents listed down here. And once again, depending on what level you're dealing with, the parents may be that second party. Because uh, the key thing here is if mama doesn't believe in what you're saying, if mama's not happy with the plan that you propose, the plan stops. All right? Now, obviously at the collegiate level, not so much. And at the professional level, you also have to add in the agent and that sort of thing. But the key thing here is, is that, as you see at the bottom of the pecking order, is the athlete. Now, obviously, we're doing all this for the athlete. But in a lot of instances, the athlete is at the lower end of the pecking order. Um, but at the end of the day, we're here to do what's best for the athlete. Now, interestingly enough, the medical uh, injury, the diagnosis, doesn't necessarily drive what we're going to do. There are a number of other factors that come into play with treating these athletes. And I've got them listed up here. Um, there are a lot of factors to consider. Obviously, if you're dealing with a professional athlete, is this a contract year? Because if it's a contract year and I'm proposing something that's going to basically keep him out this season, nine times out of ten, he's looking at me like I got two heads. All right? So now, obviously, if it's after he's gotten this new contract, then, okay, we're, we're more open to potentially having surgery, doing extensive rehab, things like that. College. Once again, you got to look at years of eligibility. If you're dealing with, say, freshman, sophomore, they still got their red shirt, once again, they're more likely to go along with, say, surgical intervention, prolonged rehab, things of that nature. Conversely, though, if they're going into their last year of eligibility, and this is the last time they're getting looks, 
then once again, they're not as likely to have some type of big procedure. Same type happens with high school. If you got your, your freshman and your sophomore, they've got time. All right, and once again, sometimes you'd be surprised you have to fight mom, you know, to get them to sit out. I've had moms sitting in the office calling the kids wimps, you know, get back on the field, and sometimes I have to have them pump the brakes. But a lot of things go into these decisions that we make, and obviously the time in the season, whether it be preseason, midseason, postseason, this all plays a role. And at the end of the day, the severity of the injury is going to uh, kind of come into play as well. If you got a multiligamentous unstable knee, okay, well, you know, it kind of goes without saying, you, you just can't go on that. But these are some of the factors that come into play when we're looking at return to play decisions and how we're managing these athletes and getting them through this maze. All right, now, what I've done is I want to look at a couple of specific hot topic items uh, that bring some of these concepts into play. And obviously, if any of us listen to the news, you know that concussions uh, have become forefront uh, with our athletes uh, as far as management. You know, we're obviously are kind of learning more and more, but we realize some of the uh, devastating and potential long-term effects that come into play when dealing with concussions. And so therefore, appropriate identification, uh, timely management, of concussions obviously is paramount at this point. So with the treatment of concussions, ideally we want to start treatment before the season starts. And what I mean by that is we want to get cognitive baseline studies before season if possible. You know, obviously everybody doesn't deal in giving the same deck of cards and so some may have better cognitive function than others. And we need to know what the baseline is. So should there be an injury, during the season, we then have information to refer to as we monitor this patient as they make their way back. Now, obviously during the season, uh, while we're involved in competition, if in fact there's an injury, at that point, then we have to do on the field, or on the sideline assessment, uh, we call it SCAT testing, the sports concussion assessment test. And there's like a little version that you can do on the sideline. If in fact the patient is down on the field, are they out? Well, obviously we know there's been a significant injury there and we're gonna go out on the field and we're gonna do our ABCs, spine precautions, all those sort of things. Uh, not to say that's easy, but that patient is easily identifiable. The patient that tends to be more of a problem is that patient that kind of took a hit and they run off the field. More times than not, the guys are not just gonna come to you and tell you, hey, hey, hey doc, I took this hit, man, I don't feel right. That's usually not the case. You know, it's kind of ingrained in those athletes to be tough. You know, so they want to get back on the field. They don't want to stop. So you have to have a high index of suspicion that something's happening. Obviously, you got other people around you that have to be on the lookout as well because you may not catch every injury. But if, in fact, you suspect that this individual has taken a hit and he's somewhat compromised, then you have to seek that individual out and go and evaluate him. Uh, some of the things that you'll do, obviously, uh, you know, we, uh, we ask them, you know, hey, you know, what's going on? What happened? Do you know what happened? If you may remember that one commercial, I uh, forget it was like for a fast food chain, and uh, the guy goes out and they're asking a the guy, hey, what happened? The guy's like, I'll have a number two, <laughs> you know, with a, with a Big Mac. Uh, no joking, though, you have to make sure that the patients are oriented as to what happened. You want to check their balance. You know, we can do uh, the different coordination testing, whether it be finger, nose, finger, hand, nose, things like that. One of the things you definitely want to check also are their short-term and intermediate memory. Because once again, a lot of times these guys are going to try to kind of hide things so they can try to get back out and play. So one of the things I'll do is as I'm evaluating them, I say, hey, look, I'm going to repeat four words to you, four or five words. I want you to call them back to me. Uh, now. In a little bit, I'm going to ask you those words, I want you to call them back to me. And so I'll do that, and I'll go on and do some other evaluations. And then at the end, I'm going to come back, and I'm going to say, okay, now what were those words I asked you before? The key thing there is that they, if they've taken a significant hit, they can't fake that. You know, they can't, they, you know, their memory will be affected. And so that's one of the things that you can do. Obviously, we want to look at their pupils, we want to test their muscle strength, things like that. Um, and then ultimately, if you're not sure, sit them. Come back. Reevaluate them a little bit later. Um, and, and that's great because nothing else, sometimes they may deteriorate. The symptoms may become more prominent uh, with a subsequent evaluation. 
Or you may go back and, you know, the guy may really be sound and you may let him go. But the key thing here is, is that if you're in doubt, you pull them out. All right, you take the helmet and you let the coach and staff know, hey, this guy's out. All right, that's important. And we also know the value of going back and rechecking because epidural hematomas, they can have that lucid interval. And then later on, you can have catastrophic uh, deterioration. So you have to be diligent. You have to go back. You have to reevaluate them. And once again, if in fact we're doubtful, we hold them out. Now, after that initial uh, on-field evaluation, then comes the subsequent evaluation. That's where the cognitive testing comes into play. And on a high school level, you have to kind of be diligent because sometimes these kids, they may not have the best resources, and so sometimes they can fall through the cracks. And so that subsequent follow-up, that subsequent evaluation sometimes may not happen. Now, in our situation, we've got sports medicine uh, uh, primary care providers that handle our concussion testing, and that's important. Depending on what level of organization you're dealing with, then you may have some other uh, uh, specialties at your, at your disposal. Obviously, collegiate level, you may uh, have them follow up neurology, neuropsych, depending on some of the symptoms. But in general, at the lower level, usually it's going to be a primary care sports med guy that's going to go back in and reevaluate them. All right? Um, in general, a lot of these things will resolve within two or three weeks. Sometimes people can get back on the field within a week. Um, that's in general. But everybody does not progress that way. And you've heard of uh, post-concussion syndrome, where individuals can have just recurrent uh, chronic headaches, chronic fatigue, uh, mood disturbances, things of that nature. So these things occur. And we have to be vigilant. We have to be on the lookout for these things so we can make sure that we treat these patients appropriately. All right. There are some people that are more prone for getting concussions. And the, the main risk factor for getting a concussion is having had a previous concussion. All right. Uh, basically, um, some of the, uh, the axons uh, and the membranes and the brain get disrupted. Uh, big chain of events that takes place, but it makes those individuals more susceptible for other concussions. So you have to be on the lookout for that. Uh, our younger athletes. Young athletes tend to be uh, more at risk for concussions than some of our older athletes, or seasoned athletes, I should say. Uh, obviously, those individuals that participate and high-impact sports are at more risk, whether that be American football, hockey, soccer, things of that nature. And then, interestingly enough, our females are more prone for concussions than the males, particularly if they're participating in the same sports with the same rules. All right. Here you can see I have listed these uh, criteria for our graded return to play, these protocols. The key thing to, uh, to remember here is that we start this return to play protocol once the patient is asymptomatic, all right? So once the headaches have resolved, uh, you know, um, the uh, fatigue, all these things, once they've resolved, then we'll start them on a gradual, uh, graduated return to play protocol. You can see we've got these different activities listed here. And we have the different uh, criteria to be met at these various stages. The key thing here is, is to progress through this protocol the patient has to remain asymptomatic at each stage. If, in fact, they then develop symptoms again, we pull them out, we sit them, and then once they're asymptomatic, we restart it, but we restart it at the last level that they were able to complete. Once they're able to get through this, then we can return them back to sport. Um, and we just kind of watch them, and we go through this, this process, and hopefully they don't have recurrent injuries. Now. I say that, and that's the usual protocol, but sometimes we need to give considerations to um, uh, either ending the season or potentially ending uh, the patient's career or the athlete's career. Uh, those individuals that have prolonged post-concussion syndrome, a lot of times you might say, hey, you know what? Um, maybe we ought to think about just kind of terminating the season this year and let's try this again next season. Uh, those individuals that have had at least two concussions within the season. Once again, you know, you might want to have that conversation. We may need to go ahead and kind of just stop this season, you know, let your brain recover, let's reset, and try it again. If you see the athlete that's got decreased academic performance now, or decreased athletic performance, at that point, once again, we might need to go ahead and just kind of pump the brakes right now. Let's, uh, let's take a step back. Let's get you healthy, and let's try this again. 
Um, those individuals that we have recurrent concussions with lowered energy, that's a problem because that obviously indicates now that their, their concussion threshold has been lowered, which makes you then feel that there are some structural uh, changes taking place here. And those individuals need to give serious consideration to potentially ending their career. If you pay attention to the news now, it's interesting. I hear more and more people that are retiring now at a younger age, particularly like NFL players and things like that. And you used to not see that. But more and more people are starting to kind of, you know, pull, pull the flag here. Uh, obviously, those individuals that have structural abnormalities on imaging uh, are non-resolving deficits. Once again, consideration needs to be given. That talk needs to be had about potentially ending the career. All right? All right. Next hot topic issue here or item, cervical spine injuries in our football players, but obviously it can take place in multiple sports. Uh, but football is one of those sports that we obviously uh, have had uh, a lot of problems with cervical spine injuries in. And as you know, there have been some devastating injuries uh, from neck injuries in our football players. Um, the key thing here is that we want to try to identify uh, some of the things that uh, make us prone for these injuries and correct them. And we've had a lot of initiatives uh, come up with tackling clinics and things like that. Uh, to try to avoid some of these issues. All right, so the first issue that we'll see most commonly uh, are the stingers, stingers, burners. Uh, ultimately, what these are, these are traction injuries to the cervical roots of the brachial plexus. Oftentimes, the patient comes in to tackle, uh, they leave the shoulder, lean their head away, and you get this, uh, this stretch injury to those structures. Oftentimes, the head will lean to the opposite side and sometimes it'll rotate back around to the affected side, which once again puts more of a stretch on those structures. Typically, the patient will come off, they've got, they're holding their arm at their side, kind of dangling it, they've got this burning, tingling, and they've got this weakness uh, in the arm, all right? Usually, these are transient. You know, usually the, the dysthesis will resolve in, say, 10 to 15 minutes. A lot of times the paresis will, too, although sometimes it can last up to 24 hours. The key thing here, though, is that as long as it's not in both arms, which would be more so indicative of spinal cord injury, as long as it's not in both arms and their, com their symptoms completely resolve, they've got a pain-free range of motion, no focal tenderness, no focal deficits, those individuals can return to play. All right? Next issue is the acute cervical strain, all right? Now, this tends to be a ligamentous injury that can have the potential for instability. Um, in this injury, the patient complains of pain in the neck, uh, limited range of motion. There's usually focal tenderness, which would obviously indicate there's injury to either soft tissue or bony structures. Uh, however, they're not complaining of symptoms in the arms, all right? Now, what I have uh, depicted on screen here to the left, I have uh, a picture of a spear tackle, all right, where the individual has lowered his head uh, and he's trying to strike uh, the opponent. This is significant because the cervical uh, spine can withstand loads imparted from contact through the paracervical musculature, the intervertebral disc, as well as the normal cervical lordosis. Once you flex the spine more than 30 degrees, then that lordosis is removed, and now these forces are being imparted into a straight segmented column. And at that point, then the neck is no longer able to dissipate those forces as readily. As those forces continue to increase, you can then get compressive deformity that takes place. And if enough force is imparted, you can get angular uh, deformity and buckling, which can lead to fractures and instability and some catastrophic issues. What I have listed here on the right, this is what we call spear tackler spine. Uh, let me see here. And how do we, uh, what's the, uh, the highlight to, there, got it. All right, so here you can see where the normal lordosis now has been lost. All right, and this is something that happens when you have individuals that have repetitively tackled in this manner. Uh, you can see diminished disc spaces and arthritic changes that start to take place at the uncovertebral and uh, facet joints. Ultimately, this spine now becomes less capable of absorbing impact. And with this, you can get acquired stenosis, which then sets those patients up for 
catastrophic injuries going forward. So it's important that we try to avoid uh, these tackling, ta tackling uh, techniques um, to avoid the formation of this type of um, spine. All right, so with the acute cervical strain, once again, the patients have decreased cervical motion. They've got uh, focal tenderness, reproducible. What do we do? Um, once again, obviously, at this point, we're going to feel we're going to do our spine precautions, the whole nine yards, and we're going to take those individuals and we're going to uh, have them imaged. The key thing is, once again, though, they don't have dysthesis or weakness or paresis into the extremities. They've got localized pain. So we'll get initial imaging, AP lats, or donatoid views, and as long as those are negative, then we can treat the patient with a collar and analgesics uh, until those symptoms resolve. Once those symptoms have resolved, then we can get flex and extension views. And if those are negative, meaning that they don't have, say, 35 millimeters of translation and uh, increased angulation between adjacent segments, as long as those are negative, then we can proceed with trying to get those patients back to plane. All right? So in general, we'll do the cervical collar, analgesics, physical therapy, uh, and once those individuals are asymptomatic, no pain, full range of motion, good strength, no focal tenderness, then we can allow those individuals to return to play. Conversely, if they have prolonged 